Good evening. Good evening. Look around. Uh -huh. Not very many people here, so you got to sing louder tonight. Okay. All right. Number 246. Let's all stand. Calvary covers it all. Far dearer than all that the world can impart Was the message that came to my heart How that Jesus alone for my sin did atone And Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all my past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. The stripes that he bore and the thorns that he wore Told his mercy and love evermore. And my heart bowed in shame as I called on his name. And Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. How matchless the grace when I look on his face, on this Jesus, my crucified Lord. My redemption come complete, I then found at his feet, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin, and stain my guilt and despair jesus took on him there and calvary covers it all thank you may be seated as we go to prayer tonight uh, let's continue to pray for the fitters um brother dale was sent home uh, the end of the week, and they were going to send him to rehab, and that got changed to home rehab. He's home, but he's he's extremely weak. He is uh, he, when he is able to walk, he walks with a walker, uh, and um, so he's in in great need of our prayer and uh, for further recovery. And then Sue was taken to the hospital, and she spent a, a night, maybe two, uh, in the hospital. They. They were able to discharge her late this afternoon. I got a call from one of the, or text from one of the daughters just a little bit before church started saying about that uh, they were sent, they had sent her mom home and they weren't sure what really all was wrong. They, they had suspected that she had a mini stroke, but um, now they're saying maybe, maybe not, uh, maybe a carotid artery issue. And of course the Alzheimer's. Um, but uh, several issues there. She's very tired, very fatigued from being away from home. And so be praying for them. They're uh, sh for sure in need of our prayers. We thank the Lord for uh, the, the improvement that Alicia saw this week. They were able to ha get her off of the ventilator this week. And that was huge, huge praise. And so we're thankful for that. Uh, continue to pray for her recovery. Uh, we do want to pray for Judy, the friend of Frank and Janet, and pray for Frank and Janet and, and all that new uh, Buck. He did pass away this week. We've been praying for him the last couple of weeks, and he did pass away. So be praying for Judy and for that family. Also, Jeanette's niece, we sent out a prayer chain this week about Jeanette's niece. 
uh, with COVID. Down, she lives down in Florida and um, is now uh, having problems with her kidneys shutting down and on dialysis. And so there's a lot of things going on there. And we, we need to keep her in, in prayer as well. And so there's obviously many needs. And uh, yesterday was the wedding for uh, Anna Romano and Ben Bailey, I believe is the last name, if I'm remembering right. And so uh, be praying for them as they start their new lives together. Be praying for the Romanos and the Hillmans traveling this week and maybe others as well. And Becky Montgomery. Uh, so there'll be several that are out traveling and so forth in a way. Keep these folks in prayer. So let's go to the Lord tonight and, and uh, begin this service with prayer together. Father, we are thankful, Lord, for how you meet needs, how you've answered so many of our prayers already. And we're thankful for that. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that you do care about our needs. And you said, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for us. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your faithful care over us. And we know that you, you, um, you care for the lily and you care about the, uh, the sparrow. And how much more does our Heavenly Father care about us? Lord, we're thankful for the, the amount of love and care that you give. And Lord, we do pray tonight for these that we've mentioned and others, too, that are on our hearts and minds. And Lord, we just pray that you would give comfort and healing to those that need it. Um, Lord, those who've lost loved ones and, and Lord, those who are sick. And Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, for the prayer list that we got this morning from Brother Fiocchi that emphasizes the spiritual needs of people, whether it's to grow or whether it's to be saved. And Lord, uh, we would pray that here too, that you would save souls and that all of us who do know you would grow in our walk with you. And so, Lord, I pray that that would even be part of our service tonight, that, that there would be a hearing of your word that would um, be such that would bring us to further growth, to be more like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, just again, reminder, if you've not picked up the scope and sequence for the fall Bible study. I would encourage you to do that tonight. Uh, why? Because you need to know what to read for next Sunday morning, <laughs> and you need to work on your Bible verses. Okay, so John 13, 13, and 14 and uh, was where we'll begin, and so I hope that you'll be working on those things throughout the week, and uh, let's be ready to say verses and have outlines ready to go for uh, next Sunday morning's Bible studies. If you haven't picked this up, and I know a lot of you have, but if you haven't picked this up, there's still copies available of this book at $5, and um, we'll help you take care of that after the service. And don't forget about church workers meeting. This is the last night to be able to register with the church. And so if you'd like to register along with us, uh, and not have to pay at the door, then please see me tonight. The church will help you take care of the cost of the seminar because we believe it's important to invest in God's people uh, so that you can be more equipped and, and maybe have your batteries charged to be able to go on and, and uh, to serve the Lord in a, in a greater way in the future. And so we do mention those things again tonight. And uh, again, thanks for being here. We are thankful for the visitors we've had the last couple of weeks. The last, uh, I think the last three Sunday mornings we've had visitors. And so I'm thankful for that. I, I praise the Lord for that. Uh, I know some of you maybe weren't here Wednesday, but praise the Lord for a new piano, huh? And uh, we thank the Lord for that and just how the Lord provides for the ministry. And if you know somebody that wants an old piano, we've got an old one to get rid of. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll about give it to you if you'll haul it off, okay? Not if we'll haul it off for you, if you'll have somebody come in and haul it off for you, okay? Uh, uh, if you want us to haul it, you'll have to pay us because we don't want to move another piano. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, we do have one we need to get rid of. And so if you know somebody that's looking for a, a, a baby grand piano, we don't need three. And we right now we've got three and we don't need three. So uh, anyway, uh, if you know somebody, you can let me know about that. But Brother Ed, will you come back and lead us some more singing? Number 383, James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. 383, close to thee. <clears throat> Thou my everlasting portion, more than friend or life to me. 
All along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee. All along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with Thee. Not for ease or worldly pleasure, nor for fame my prayer shall be. Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with Thee. Close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee, close to Thee. All of the fail I toil and suffer, only let me walk with thee. Lead me through the veil of shadows, bear me o'er life's fitful sea. Through the gate of life eternal, may I am her Lord with thee. Close to thee, close to thee, close to thee, close to thee. Through the gate of life eternal, may I enter, Lord, with thee. Now turn over to number 402. Footsteps of Jesus, 402, and let's all stand. <clears throat> We're going to sing the first and the fourth verse. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where the footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where ere they go. Then at last, when on high he sees us, our journey done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus and at his throne. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where there they go. You may be seated. Right. As we prepare for offering tonight, I'll let the young men come forward. And as they do, uh, let me just say a, a word of thanks. Uh, the uh, funeral service last week for Brother Nelson, Pastor Nelson, went well down in Chillicothe. And then this past Monday, he was um, buried here in Belvedere. And uh, Pastor Jett from Southside Baptist in Chicago did the service. He had worked as an assistant pastor for Pat, with Pastor Nelson here in Belvedere for 11 years, I believe he said, and did a great job, and uh, praise the Lord for that. And certainly, Pastor Nelson had an impactful ministry uh, on the lives of many people here in Belvedere while he was here. I wanted to share just a, a word of testimony, though, um, that I think all of us can appreciate. Pastor Nelson was extremely, extremely influential, used by the Lord uh, in the process of Faith Baptist Church, or us, uh, uh, securing this building. And, um, you know, there were those who said that the buildings and grounds here uh, should be sold for the highest dollar and, and uh, maybe for secular purposes, and, of course, Brother Nelson had ministered here, and much of the building was either renovated or built under his leadership. And he came back, and he pled with 
them not to do that. And God used him to help in the process. And there were others that God used too. Jim Aaron had a big part in that, and Al Henninger, and there's, there's others who were involved in that process. But one of the men that God no doubt used, and we ought to be thankful for, was Pastor Nelson in that. And, uh, you know, I believe that God provided all that we have. As a church, everything we have is from the Lord. And you know how God provides for His church? Through people. God used people like Pastor Nelson and Jim Aaron and others. And uh, you know how God is providing tonight? Through you and me and our giving in this offering. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for every person that you have used both in the past and present to provide for the ministry of your local body here at Faith Baptist Church. Lord, we're so thankful for how you've provided along the way. And Lord, how you continue to meet needs and provide. And Lord, help us all to be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us. But Lord, I would also pray tonight that we as a body, as a church, would also be good stewards of what you give to us as a church, including the buildings and property that you've entrusted to us. Help us to be good stewards of it all, realizing that it all belongs to you. May we manage it for you in a way that glorifies your name, reaches the lost, and builds your body. And Lord, so now bless this offering, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, take your Bibles tonight and turn to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. And when you find Exodus 14, I would uh, encourage you also to take your Bible and turn to a New Testament uh, book, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. So we'll look at both of them. We'll spend most of our time in Exodus 15, but we're going to start in chapter 14. And then we're also going to just begin by looking at a couple verses in, um, uh, in 1 Corinthians. So if you can find those two places. And uh, evidently somebody spoke and used this mic who was softer speaking than I am because the mic was turned up a lot, normal, a lot further than normal. Okay, <laughs> anyway, we'll get that fixed. All right, so Exodus chapter 14. Boy, what an exciting passage we are. Uh, in here, and what we're going to see happen in, in response to that. But let's go ahead and read it. Let's be familiar with where we were at uh, as we pick up our study now in Exodus chapter 14. Look down at verse number 27. Now, I'm not going to have you read it out loud with me tonight, but boy, wasn't that fun this morning. I enjoyed that, and uh, boy, I appreciated that. But now look at our Bible, verse 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the uh, morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and, and the horsemen and all of the host of Pharaoh and that came into the sea after them. And there remained not, not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Now, I'll tell you, friend, I believe that this is perhaps one of the most dramatic scenes in world history. This was an inc incredible event that took place. Now, obviously, it was... It was not just dramatic, it was impossible, it was miraculous, it was divine, God did it. And I, I appreciate the wording here that the Holy Spirit uh, gave us, that Israel saw the work which the Lord did. Boy, great and marvelous are his works, are they not? And boy, they are here. And what a dramatic scene. Now, in the New Testament, I'm, I want to just, I want to take a little bit of a sidetrack here, just to remind us of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this chapter because last year, you know, we spent this last year, we, we've uh, come through a study of 1 Corinthians. And so I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time in 1 Corinthians 10, but I want you to be reminded of something that is said here that I think is um, important as we finish chapter 14. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant or without knowledge how that our, our fath all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. I believe he's talking there about the Red Sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, uh, what does this all mean about being baptized unto Moses. Well, obviously, okay, first of all, he is referencing, 1 Corinthians 10, he is referencing the crossing of the Red Sea. And so uh, what does he mean again by this baptism? Well, Israel, coming out of Egypt, in many ways, pictures a coming out from the world, a salvation experience. A salvation from bondage to life and freedom to follow God. You and I 
our, in our natural state, we are born enslaved to sin, and we are uh, held captive in this world. And when we get saved, we, there is this freedom that comes to us. There's this freedom from bondage that now allows us to be free to serve God and to go where God wants and to live as God would direct. And so that is really a great picture of salvation. The crossing of the Red Sea is a picture, I believe, that we can actually say this is a, a biblical picture based on 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 and 2, that it's a picture of believer's baptism. Think about it. The walls of water on either side of them, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 mentions that, and, and the sea, and then 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and verse 2 says, the sea, or, uh, that's the second thing it mentions, and the cloud. In other words, the cloud of God that was over them and behind them, and the walls of water on either side. That is, we could say that God's presence was above them and behind them. This is all an illustration that they were immersed. It, it and, and it would be uh, this event that would identify them with God and his leader, Moses. That is, they were immersed into being willing to subject themselves to the leadership of God through the man Moses. When you and I got saved, we were obviously delivered out of sin so that now we can follow God. And God gave us his Holy Spirit, which is a great picture of the cloud, which is a Shekinah glory, this physical uh, demonstration of the power of God. We got something maybe even greater than a cloud or a pillar, we've got the Holy Spirit himself living inside of us. And then we are able to go into believer's baptism and be immersed. And what does it do? He talked about this this morning. It identifies us with Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ that baptism pictures. And so uh, it's also a testimony that we are going to seek to live to follow him. And uh, these people were crossing the Red Sea because they were identifying with the cloud above them and they were following his leadership. Now, verse 31, back in our text, in Exodus chapter 14, tells us that these people, as we heard this morning, went from unbelief to belief. They were willing to follow God's man, Moses. Now, the, the, rea the reaction to this um, this whole event would have been very, very incredible, don't you think? If you had been the slaves in your family, and you had just gone through all of those plagues in Egypt, now they didn't experience all of the plagues, you understand that, but witnessed them, and now they have come out, and the armies are now pursuing them, they're trapped behind uh, and, and in front, and God delivers, and he parts the waters. And then they cross on dry land. I mean, how does that river bottom dry up? It dries up, and they are going across, no problem. And then God crashes the waters on the Egyptians, and not one of them that was in the midst of that river lived. The Bible tells us not one of them lived. And as they're standing there, I can't imagine the noise of the crashing and the crying out. Whoa, and the crying out. Yeah, I about go off here. All right, forgot which shoes I was wearing tonight. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be entertaining? Anyway, so um, for you. <laughs> and, uh, and so what an event. I mean, this is incredible. And I can imagine the noise. For those of you that have been at the ocean, isn't it just those, those waves coming in? Boy, there's just a roar to it, and it's it's a beautiful thing. But this these are were walls of water crashing. Wow, what an experience! And then and then they see the bodies. The Bible says this that the bot they saw the bodies washing up onto the shore of the dead Egyptian army. This is an uh, I mean, can you imagine the emotional uh, uh, level? that everybody would have been at at that moment. What do you do with all that emotion? What do you do with, with all of the reality that 
that army isn't going to get us. That God has just given us a victory. What, 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 what is your response to that? What do you, how do you in any way communicate what you are living in that moment? You know, I, I, this is really, really important. We get into chapter 15, we'll see what Moses leads them to do. But I would suggest to you that what they do, we never have seen them do before. Matter of fact, you don't see that Moses do this at the burning bush. Now that alone would have been a remarkable thing to see, wouldn't it? Been? Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. Oh, man, that would have been a remarkable and fearful moment. When they see the water of the Nile turn to blood, it would have been a remarkable sight. All of the plagues. What happened when they applied the blood and the angel passed over them? Even the night of the Passover, when their firstborns were spared of death, they did not do this thing. At least, let me say this, it was never recorded that they've done this, that I can, can remember. Now, if you find a place where it was recorded, then tell me. But I, I don't know of any place recorded that they did what they did here at any moment. They did something that I believe every believer should be engaged in throughout our lives. They had a praise service. Again, this never happened that I know of in Egypt. But Moses became a songwriter and a music leader. And look at verse 1 of chapter 15. Then, based on when, this, when the Lord did this, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. They were, in many ways, spiritual babes. They had just had what we might see as a, as a salvation experience. And they had just gone through what we might say was a, a baptism. At least that's the way Paul pictured it. And he used it as that illustration. They were babes in Christ. They were, in many ways, immature in their faith. Why? How do we know that? Because a mature Christian will sing in the night and dark seasons. As well as in the dark, as well as in the light and glorious seasons. It took an incredible scene for them to be brought to song. But oh, how great it is for the Christian who has learned to trust the Lord and sing his praise to his unchanging character, both in the dark and in the light. I remember hearing as a child coming across. Our little FM radio from WPGM in Danville, Pennsylvania, from the Christian radio station. A program entitled Songs in the Night. Songs in the Night. You know, friend, it's important that we learn to sing praise to God in our dark moments, in the moments when the enemy is trapping us in and when he has delivered. He is worthy at all times to receive our praise and to receive our song. But obviously the, the moment was so great and they, they begin to break out in song and Moses writes a song for them to sing. Just earlier they were complaining about Moses. They were complaining about how God had brought them out there to die. And by the way, that would be a continual playbook for the children of Israel in their griping. Matter of fact, they wouldn't hardly get done singing the song that they would realize that they were hungry and complained again about God bringing them out there to die. But in this moment, in this moment, they would be brought from murmuring to music. 
they would be brought from complaining to cheering. They would be brought from, from pouting to praise. And I'm telling you, friend, if you and I will just recognize the great works that God is doing right now, we won't be so tempted to murmur and to gripe and to complain. We instead will be brought to a place of praise and gratitude for what God is doing. So important. I love how he starts out in this, in this um, uh, introduction to the song in verse number one. He says, I will sing unto the Lord. You know, that little phrase is repeated different times throughout Scripture. In Judges chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, Hear ye, O king, O ye princes, I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will praise the Lord God of Israel. The psalmist used a similar expression in Psalm 13 in verse 6. He says, I will sing unto the Lord. Why? Because he has dealt bountifully with me. In Psalm 104 in verse 33, I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. He says, as long as I have breath, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to use that breath to praise the Lord. Two words, I believe, are very important that are repeated in every one of those passages. Those two little words are, I will. Do you know that I will indicates a choice of the will? Praise is a choice. Praise is a choice of the will. And I would suggest this, pouting is also a choice of the will. Pouting, down in the mouth. Murmuring, griping. You know, you have to make a choice about that. But so do we have a choice to praise. And Moses says, I will. It's a choice to praise. I will sing unto the Lord. You know, in deliverance, as God delivered here, there, they saw this as an opportunity to praise. And I would just simply remind us that when God shows us how he's delivering and how he's working, that we need to make sure that in the moment of deliverance, we praise the deliverer. Sometimes, if we're not careful, our flesh thinks that somehow we had something to do with it. In other words, that the delivered gets praise when it belongs to the deliverer. I, I know that many times we've used the illustration, and you've heard it different times about someone being lost and, and, and unsaved being like somebody drowning in the ocean, and the boat comes by, and they throw out the lifeline, and if the person will take hold of the lifeline, they will pull them in the boat and save them. They'll deliver them, okay? You've heard similar illustrations to that. And um, when the person gets in the boat, he's not the one that gets credited the hero. Well, I was just such a savable guy. I mean, I was out there in the water. Who else were they going to save? I'm just such a savable person. They don't call him the hero. The one that gets the credit is the one who did the delivering. And here's the thing. When God delivers in your life and when God does his miraculous work in my life, uh, we should not think that we have had anything to do with it, but give the praise to the one who has done the delivering, the Lord himself, the deliverer. I appreciated many things that uh, Brother Farnham said last week. And last Sunday night, he was talking about prayer, and he was talking about praying specific prayers. I think that's so important. You've heard me talk about that, too. But the Lord convicted me this week as I thought on this message. What about praising specific praises? We pray, and we are to ask for specific things, but in getting specific answers ought to come a specific praise. We shouldn't just say, Lord, thank you for the day and everything in it. 
What did God do for you today that you can praise his name for? What waters did he part for you? What mouths of the lions did he stop for you? What has he prevented from you? Uh, how has he provided for you? Be specific in your praise. And that is so true here because Moses is going to become very specific in his praise for what God has done. You know, he says here, I will praise the Lord. Verse 1, do you see both times in verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3 and right on down the chapter? It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D for Lord. This is the word that is translated uh, this way to tell us that this is Jehovah. And it's mentioned, his name is mentioned 10 times in this passage. You know why? Because the praise, the theme of the song is all about him. The theme of our song and the theme of our praise should never be more about us than it is about him. And that would be true here. Now, commentators will break this song up into sometimes four, maybe five stanzas. I believe it's I believe that it's four uh, and uh, uh, then a refrain. Um, and I could see maybe they would have a fifth one. But uh, I'm going to show you the five stanzas. I'm going to do this rather quickly tonight. I want to take us through the five stanzas of the song that Moses leads them to sing in praise to God here. So first of all, stanza one. Stanza one, if you were taking notes, is this deliver a declaration of victory. In the first verse of the hymn, they are going to declare the victory that they have received. This is verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5 is a declaration of victory. We've read verse 1. Now look at verse 2. He says, The Lord is my strength and, the, and song, and he is become my salvation. By the way, David would quote that almost directly. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Fair on his chariots, his host hath cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also are drowned in the Red Sea, the depths have covered them. They sank under the bottom as a stone. Oh, God has defeated the Egyptians. He says the enemy was thrown, thrust into the sea. In verse 5, he says they sunk as stones. He told him in the previous chapter, he says they they sunk like stones, but they washed up onto the shore. He calls them, in verse number 10, uh, he, he pictures them as chunks of lead sinking to the bottom. He calls them, in verse number 7, he calls them the, the stubble that was consumed, like stubble that was burned up. It was totally destroyed, forever destroyed. Pharaoh had ordered the baby boys, those Hebrew baby boys, to be drowned in the Nile. I know that's going back a month or two now in our study, but you remember it. Moses' life was spared. But those baby boys, and you know what? God was repaying the evil that was done. These men would be drowned to death. Could have God taken the lives of the army in another fashion, yes or no? Yes. I believe that God chose drowning to speak that he is a just God. Oh, we had a glorious prayer time tonight, and the Lord led me to pray about what is happening in our country. The millions, I believe we're six million babies that have been murdered in this country under the uh, 
law, uh, the, uh, the legal, legalness of abortion. Friend, we need to be praying for those who will have to defend the law in Texas. And I understand that we would like for abortion to just completely be uh, illegal at all stages. And certainly we believe that life begins at conception. And we do not apologize for what we believe from the Bible about the value and uh, the sacredness of human life. We do not apologize for that. But I am thankful that God is using people to write legislation and to sign legislation in different places to, to support and to defend human life. Praise God for that. Pray that more will have the courage and opportunity to defend it. It sickened me about three years ago. I believe we're in about three years ago now where here in our own state, the governor signed a law that state income tax money that you and I pay could, be, could fund Planned Parenthood. It sickens me that our tax dollars go to fund the murder of babies here in our state. It's sickening. I hope it's still sickening. We ought to be bothered by it. I'll tell you what, friend. There is no sin that God is going to leave undealt with. And I believe that God uh, here is saying, I am a just God. And let's continue to pray for people to have courage to stand up against this hideous sin. Boy, it got quiet in here. I hope you believe that. I hope you believe that. Verse number three, he refers to God as a man of war. Now, when we first read that God is a man of war, don't emphasize the fact that he's calling God a man. That's something that happens other places in Scripture. It's not unique here. What is he saying about God? He is saying that God is a warrior. He is picturing God as a warrior. In chapter 14, verse 14, hey, it was God who was going to fight for you, Moses said. God would fight for you. There is a term in the Bible God, a name for the Lord, and it is the Lord of hosts. You read that a lot throughout the scripture, the Lord of hosts. Matter of fact, 280 plus times in the Bible, you read the little name, Lord of hosts. What does that mean? It means the Lord of the armies. It's the name Jehovah Shabbat. We sing songs of God that have a militant theme. The fight is on. We sing onward Christian soldiers. Why? Because we're in a battle. But the battle is the Lord's, and we must, uh, as he calls in the song for volunteers, a volunteer for Jesus, a soldier too. In another song that we know, in verse number two, he says, Did we in our own strength confide our striving or our fighting would be losing? We're not the, now listen to those words of the songwriter. We're not the right man on our side. Now, the songwriter in a mighty fortress of our God there is the rights man is a capital M. Why? Because he's referring to God. Was it wrong for him to refer to God as a man in that verse of song? No, because he's referring to what Moses is saying about God right here in song. And then he goes on and he says, if I have the right man on our side, then he goes on, the man, capital M, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Now listen to the next word, Lord Sabbath, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. You know what we're reading there and what we're singing in that song? We are singing uh, Exodus chapter 15 and verse number 3, that the Lord is the man of war. That is, he is Lord Sabbath. That is his name. Another passage, Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 13. The Lord shall, in capital, it's a Jehovah. The Lord shall uh, go forth as a mighty man. 
Here he is again called a mighty man. That is the man of war. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. He shall roar as the lion. In C.S. Lewis's book on Narnia, you will remember that at one point before the children meet Aslan, before they approach him, they asked, I believe it is to Mr. Beaver, the question. Do you remember what the question was? Is it safe? And Mr. Beaver replied what? Is it safe? No, it's not safe. In other words, there needs to be a fearfulness in the presence of God. And no, it's not safe. But you can go there and trust him to act according to his character. You know what? Here it is. Here he says, he's a man of war. That's the first stanza. The first stanza is a declaration of victory. Number two. I got to keep going here quickly. Verse number six. Six through ten is the second stanza. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. How would you like singing that? Lord, your arm just tore the enemy apart. Woohoo! What a song to sing in church. And in the greatness of his excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils in the waters were gathered together, and the floods stood upright as a heap, and the deeps, the depths uh, were uh, congealed uh, in the uh, heart of the sea. Brother Farnham talked about that last week. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide with the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon me. I will draw uh, my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, and the sea covered them, and they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Okay, verse number two. This section is about the weapons of war that God used. First is declaration of victory. The second focuses on the weapons. Now, you will remember here that he is using human features to describe something about God. God is, and Brother Farnham talked about this last week, God is so great, and God is not limited to our finite mind but God describes himself in human characteristics so we can understand a characteristic about the Lord. He talks about here his arm. Other places he talks about the eyes of the Lord. Uh, obviously, God doesn't have arms and so forth. I understand Jesus came and put on human flesh. But uh, in speaking of Jehovah, we, we understand that he is God. There is a theological term for this. It's called anthropomorphism. And I won't get into all of that. But basically, we're taking a spiritual aspect of God, and we're using some physical means uh, or even human in nature to be able to describe something about God. Verse 6 and 7, he, he has a strong hand or arm that throws them to the sea. Like a good fire, he consumes them. And then in verse 8, 9, and 10, there is this emphasis on his breath, this breath of his nostril and the wind. You know, every enemy says that they will, what they're going to do. Do you remember the I wills of Satan? I will, I will. And he ends up saying, and I will be like the what? The most high. Satan says, I'm going to do this, and I will do this. And in pride, he lifts himself up against God. And that's exactly what you see in verse number nine. I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide. My lust shall be satisfied. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Six I wills. God says with his breath, no, you won't. 
and the waters come crashing down. I am telling you what, Satan will always oppose God, and this world and even our flesh will oppose the things of God, but God is greater than the I wills of the enemy. The army of God, the arm of God speaks of his strength. You know, um, all of these things can be pictured in the Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks of his great strength, the arm of the Lord, the hand of the Lord. It talks that Jesus' eyes are described as flames of fire. His breath is, is pictured also in, in Jesus as a, as a double-edged sword. The words coming out of his mouth. Stanza 3. Stanza 3 begins in verse number 11. He says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Remember, all of the plagues in Egypt were pointed at a god, at idolatry. Who is like, unto, like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth thy people, which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold in the inhabitants of Palestine. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. Thy greatness of thine arm shall be as still as a stone. Oh, friend, the third stanza, which is verse 11 through verse 16, is the superiority of God. What is he talking about in the third verse? The superiority of God. Let me put it this way. As one commentator said, God tolerates no rivals. The gods of Egypt were defeated before this world. And he says, who is like the Lord? And the answer is no one. <laughs> the answer in verse 11 begins to give a depiction of God. He is the one that is glorious in holiness. He is the one great, uh, the one of great praise. He is great in wonders. He is, verse 12, powerful. Mercy that saves and strength to guide or to lead. Both are, are pictured in this verse of song. God, by mercy, redeems them, and then he gives them grace to guide them. And then he talks about how others will hear of his superiority. In verse 14, how they're going to fear God. You know, when uh, Joshua sent in the spies and they met with Rahab, you know what Rahab was telling them about? How their hearts melted and how their courage was gone because they heard what had happened back in Egypt what God had done for them. You know, our testimony, I'm speaking about you and me tonight, our testimony should be a testimony of the greatness of our God before the lost. There ought to be something in our testimony and in our, our life that shows the lost the superiority of God. Let me give you the fourth and last stanza. And that is, he focuses in the last verse of song on the promises that they're going to believe by faith for the future. Look at verse 16. He says, Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, thy, uh, they shall be still as a stone. They're going to, be, they're going to freeze. They're going to, they're going to be paralyzed. Till thy people, notice this, till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. He called them redeemed. Now he's called them purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. This is the last verse, verse 16 through 18. This part is focusing on the future promises, what they believe that God will do for them 
in fulfilling his promise and giving them the promised land. He calls us in, in verse number 16, he calls them thy people. We're the people, Lord, that belong to you. And we're going to go to the place of the Lord. You know what this means? He, he says, we're going to go to the place of the Lord, the very next verse. And then he says, we're going to go to that place which is the sanctuary. We're going to go to where you're at, God. We're going to dwell with you. In other words, they are singing this praise song saying, God, you will be our God and we will be your people. They are praising the Lord for this relationship that they have with him. God brought them out of Egypt. God would bring them into Canaan. He freed them and would bring them into a place of blessing and rest and fruitfulness if they would continue to follow. Verse 18, he ends his song by saying God is in control and his control is without end. What a crescendo to the hymn. What a, what a climax to the hymn. Lord, you shall reign forever and ever. God, there's nothing that's going to stop you. Look what you just did to the army. God, you're going to reign forever. God, you, nobody's going to overthrow you. Man, look what you just did, Lord. This is awesome. God, nobody can ever throw you off your throne. Wow. What a great time of praise. Let me ask you this tonight. I know it. Maybe you're tired and it's late and it's hard to be excited. But I, I didn't preach at all this morning, so I've got plenty. Let me ask you this. Are you excited about what God's doing? I mean, we can pout and we can murmur and we can gripe and we can miss out on what God's doing all around us. I'm asking you, are you excited about what God Are you singing and celebrating the goodness of God. When was the last time that you were in all of his glory and his goodness and all that he's doing for you? My friend, God's been so good to you and me. When was the last time that you were like, wow, God, you are awesome. I mean, that's the moment, that's the moment that they're having. I don't know if Moses used the word awesome beside the sea, but when those waters came crashing down, there was some teenager saying, wow, that's awesome, cool. When was the last time you got excited about what God's doing? I don't know if we use this word, but do you ever get giddy? Do you know what it means to get giddy? I hope it's appropriate to use that word. I was thinking about that. Do you ever get lighthearted? Do you, do you ever get exuberant about what God's doing? What he's done for you in the past and saving you and bringing you out of bondage? What God's doing right now in your life and what God has promised to do for you in the future? That's what this song is all about. There's something we ought to sing about and that something is really someone. Think about the songs that we sing that talk about singing. I thought about that. Maybe you can come up with your own list. But there are songs that we sing that tell us to sing. How about this one? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his and his mercy and his grace. How about this one? Sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. How about this one? I will sing of, of my Redeemer. Sing of him all the night long. Sing uh, for I cannot be silent for he is the theme of my song. How about this one? We sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the blowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. We sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full bright at his command and all the stars obey. How about the next verse of that song? We sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. <laughs> and he says, I, not eyes. I think he was talking to me. If I survey the ground I tread, or gaze upon the skies. How about another song? 
I will sing to the Lord with a praise song, for the Lord has heard my cry. How about this one? Singing, I go along life's road, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing, I go along the ro life's road, for Jesus said, has carried my load. Friend, we have something, we have someone to sing about and to praise his name. There's a little, little song on Christian radio that they would sing before they had a, a call-in show every morning on the weekday. You could call in and, and request a song for somebody's wedding anniversary or birthday or whatever. And they always introduced the program, and they had this little ditty that they played. And I, I don't even know if, uh, if it's a real song. I mean, I'm sure it's a real song, but never heard it anywhere else. It went something like this. Sing in the darkest night. Sing when the day is bright. Every day, all the way, let us sing, sing, sing. You know what, friend? I think that's a good thing for us tonight to be reminded of. Sing in the darkest night. Sing when the day is bright. Every day, all the way, let us sing, sing, sing. Moses led the people to singing about God's victory from the past. His military presence for the present. His superiority for eternity. And his expectancy for the future. That's the four themes of song. And may these be the themes of our song to our God. You know, friends, since God never changes our song to him should never change either. He's worthy of our praise song tonight. And you know what? No matter what happens in the next 24 hours tomorrow night, he'll be worthy of our song. Father, we thank you for how we can learn from the example of Moses leading the others into praising your name. Lord, I pray that we would also be found faithful in praising you for the salvation that we've received, you who are the deliverer, for your mighty works and your superior nature, that you are eternal and you never change. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would always be mindful of you and, and praise you for who you are, for your works, for who you are as a person. Lord, that you would receive worship from our lips and praise and song. Lord, may you be the focus of our life. And Lord, I pray that even in our praise, we would be protected from murmuring and complaining, from doubt and fear. Lord, bring us to a place of confidence and dependence on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you take your hymn book tonight? And we'll sing 388. Where he leads, I'll follow. Let's stand to our feet, page 388. Maybe tonight there's a decision you need to make and praise to the Lord. Maybe, maybe our attitude's been wrong. Maybe we need to change it by giving praise to our great God. But let's praise him in song as we sing page 388. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me I will follow where he leads me. I will follow where he leads me. I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Father, we thank you I uh, for your goodness, for how you speak to us, for how you teach us. 
how you remind us of truth from your word. I pray, Lord, that you would protect us this week from evil and from temptation. Help us to walk in the Spirit. Help us to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be soul conscious and win the lost. Help us to be filled with the knowledge of your will. Oh, God, in all things, help us to be found faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.